what Adorno means by Hegelian self-consciousness, followed by an essay in four parts on self-referentiality. Before the formation of the individual in the modern sense, writes Theodore Adorno in negative dialectic, in the sense meaning not simply the biological human being, but the one constituted as a unit by its own self-reflection, the Hegelian self-consciousness, it is an anachronism to talk of freedom, whether as a reality or as a challenge." Unquote. I understand Adorno's reference to Hegelian self-consciousness in the following way. I cannot be conscious of myself, that is, of my thoughts, feelings, and perceptions, without imagining that I have divided into an observing self and an observed self. But I cannot imagine such a division without imagining in turn that I have distanced myself, the observer, from myself, the observed, as if I were perceiving an object located outside myself. At once the question arises, what then is the nature of this distance between me, the observing subject, and myself, the observed object? The distance cannot be spatial as a normal perception, because observer and observed are presumed to occupy the same body throughout the act of differentiation into one and other. Nor can the distance be temporal, because observer and observed are presumed simultaneously to occupy the same body throughout the act of differentiation. Yet distance there must be for my endeavor to become aware of myself, even to be conceivable. Otherwise, if I eliminate the distance between observer and observed, between one and other, I resume my seamless unity and remain unconscious of myself. Therefore, I answer the question, what is the nature of the distance between me, the observing subject, and myself, the observed object, by saying that the distance is imaginary. By which I mean that by imagining that the conditions of spatial perception obtain in the conceptual realm, I mirror my thoughts, feelings, and perceptions as if they were objects reflected back to me from a distance. By virtue of this poetic conceit, I am able to monitor and adjust my behavior as if I were a person other than myself, while at the same time still remaining myself. Note, Hegel, of course, didn't invent using self-reflection as a philosophic technique. Here are three examples of pre-Socratic Greek philosophy cited by Diogenes Laertius. Quote, Mycen was seen in Lacedaemon laughing to himself in a lonely spot, and when sub someone suddenly appeared and asked him why he laughed when no one was near, he replied, that is just the reason. In other words, Mycen was debating something with himself and, realizing that he was witnessing the debate as if he were another person, he laughed at the idea of being another person when only he was present. Here's another anecdote from the same author. Pyrrho would finish what he had to say to no audience. On being discovered once talking to himself, he answered, when asked the reason, that he was practicing being good. The following remark about Antithenes explains what Pyrrho meant by saying he was practicing being good. Antithenes said that philosophy enables one to socialize with oneself. The same philosopher called Plato smoky. Okay. If philosophy is self-reflection, that is, a kind of listening hard to one's conversation with oneself, then philosophy is an act of sociability carried on in solitude. Therefore, if in the course of talking to himself, Pyrrho felt obliged to, to, 
Pyrrho felt obliged to seek the approval of the dispassionate witness, namely himself, overhearing the conversation, as he might have felt obliged to seek the approval of another person actually present, he was practicing being good, that is, practicing being socially responsible. End of note. Karl Marx applies to history the Hegelian division of consciousness into one and other. If the members of a community are to own cooperatively the communal means of production, each member must consider him or herself capable of uniting the diverse roles of owner and worker into a combined owner-worker. Otherwise, workers cannot consider themselves in business for themselves. Furthermore, just as Hegel conceives of self-reflection as a union of logical opposites, namely of one and other, so Marx revisions society as the union of historical opposites, namely of owners and workers. The upshot is that the self-aware human, aware, that is, of uniting historical historical opposites in his or her own person replaces the natural unselfconscious human, the so-called innocent, as a social ideal. The moment this transformation of point of view takes place among large masses of people, and how to enable it to take place is the challenge of revolutionary theory, the cooperative owner-worker society supersedes the competitive owner-versus-worker society. Finally, since self-awareness, like any spiritual stance, is a state of mind which is freely adopted or freely rejected, and similarly, since the socio-economic transformation of the population at large likewise succeeds or fails as a result of being freely subscribed to or just as freely resisted, Adorno can say that unless one speaks of free freedom in the Hegelian sense, that is, in the sense that each person chooses or not to become the self-aware embodiment of hitherto opposed historical roles, in contrast to thinking of oneself as performing either one or the other, but not both roles at the same time, that is, as either worker or owner, but not as worker-owner in business for himself, Quote, it is an anachronism to talk of freedom, whether as a reality or as a challenge. Unquote. It is out of date to talk of freedom as it exists at present or as it might exist in the future, because whether people are free or not depends on whether they own and manage the economy themselves or whether they work for others who own and manage it for them whereby these others determine the meaning and value of labor and not the people themselves. Five examples of self-referentiality. Lucullus, Hercules' groundkeeper, Hannibal, Richard III, Groucho Marx. Since egalitarian society requires each of its members to split into worker-owner and at the same time to unite the contrasting social roles by viewing them from a third self-referential point of view which transcends the division, I offer five examples of self-referentiality in the hope of normalizing the concept. For self-referential statements, like the ancient one, the Cretan says that all Cretans lie, that is, if the Cretan speaks the truth that all Cretans lie, he lies, but if he lies when he claims that all Cretans lie, he speaks the truth. These statements immediately hypnotize us. But because the spell is presented in the form of a game, we are challenged to break the spell if we can, unlike the spell we all live under in the real world, a spell enforced by the threat of violence being used against us should we attempt to dispel it.
The first example is from Plutarch's life of the Roman general Lucullus, Dryden's Plutarch. Quote, it is plain from the anecdotes on record of him that Lucullus was not only pleased with, but even gloried in his way of living, for he is said to have feasted several Greeks upon their coming to Rome day after day, who, of a true Grecian principle, being ashamed and declining the invitations, where so great an expense was every day incurred for them, he with a smile told them, some of this indeed, my Grecian friends, is for your sakes, but more for that of Lucullus. Once when he supped alone, there being only one course, and that but moderately furnished, he called his steward and reproved him, who, professing to have supposed that there would be no need of any great entertainment when nobody was invited, was answered, What? Did you not know then that today Lucullus dines with Lucullus? Unquote. The narrative is composed of two anecdotes, the first of which prepares the reader to understand the second. In the first anecdote, the two social roles of host and guest are clearly distinguished. Lucullus, the lavish host, provides the fare, and his Greek friends, his somewhat embarrassed guests, enjoy it. When his guests demure at continuing to be the recipients of his generosity, Lucullus answers, if I interpret his words correctly, that the company of guests enhances the enjoyment of the host. By telling an introductory anecdote, which involves as self-understood the complementary social roles of host and guest, Plutarch provides the reader with the key that decodes the meaning of the second anecdote. In the second anecdote, the roles of guest and host are telescoped into one. Although Lucullus eats alone, as host, Lucullus provides the fare. As guest, he enjoys it. But they added Philip to his reproof of his steward's thrift. What, did you not know then that Lucullus dines with Lucullus? Is that Lucullus enjoys his own company as much as if he considered himself his own guest. And to emphasize the paradox of being guest and host at one and the same time, he refers to himself in the third person as if, in addition to Lucullus the host and Lucullus the guest, Guest, a third Lucullus were present to document the fact that Lucullus has split in two. Lucullus's wit pivots on the difference between perception and logic. His steward sees that his master dines alone. That's perception. But when his master refers to himself as two Lucullus's, implying a Lucullus who is host and a Lucullus who is guest, the distinction is logical. And it is this incongruence between perceptual truth and logical validity that makes one smile at the notion that Lucullus dines with Lucullus. But the incongruence faintly suggests the theory of how consciousness arises. I see, I hear, I smell, I taste, I touch. But how is it, I ask, that I possess one consciousness instead of five, each consciousness associated with a different sense, and thus, like the senses, each consciousness irreconcilable with the other? For surely sounds, sights, smells, tastes, and touches are incomparable. Each is a unique and inimitable way of perceiving the world. Therefore, I speculate that the only way I know I am one and the same person is because I experience the different sensations simultaneously. I am this simultaneity. The simultaneity of sight and sound, for instance, when I see a car veer and hear it screech to a halt, is how I know it is I who sees and hears. For simultaneity is not a positive sensation like sight or sound. It is not a sixth sense. If it were, it would have its own characteristic quality that made it incompatible with the other senses, and thus it, it would be unable to relate the senses to each other. 
Rather, for me to experience the simultaneity of the senses, I must produce that experience out of my own imagination. To be specific, I must imagine an inner space which, like the indifference of physical space to the objects which occupy it, it is not a sixth sense. If it were, it would have its own characteristic quality that made it incompatible with the other senses, and thus it would be unable to relate the senses to each other. Rather, for me to experience the simultaneity of the senses, I must produce that experience out of my own imagination. To be specific, I must imagine an inner space which, like the indifference of physical space to the objects which occupy it, responds to the simultaneity simultaneity of different sensations without implicating itself in the unique qualities of any one of them. My experience of the simultaneity of different sensations occurring in this imagined inner space manifests as consciousness of myself. In other words, I appear to witness the sensations as if I were outside them looking on as much as being inseparable from the sensations I witness. This act of looking on at the sensations at the same time as I experience them is the source of logical as distinct from perceptual discrimination. Because of it, Lucullus, who is aware of the difference between what is in his mind and what his eye beholds, is able to play off the hostly, guestly double Lucullus of logic against the single Lucullus of perception, in contrast to his servant, who perceives only the single Lucullus of perception. Here's another example of self-referentiality from Dryden's Plutarch. Romulus, Volume 1. Quote, Others think that the first rise of this fable of the she-wolf nursing Romulus and Remus came from the children's nurse through the ambiguity of her name, for the Latins, who called her Lupa, not only called wolves Lupi, but also women of loose life, and such a one was then wife of Faustulus, who nurtured these children. Aca Laurentia by name. To her the Romans offer sacrifices, and in the month of April the priest of Mars makes libations there. It is called the Laurentian Feast. They honor also an another Laurentia for the following reason. The keeper of Hercules' temple, having it seems little else to do, proposed to his deity a game at dice, laying down that if he himself won, he would have something valuable of the god, but if he were beaten, he would spread him a noble table and procure him a fair lady's company. Upon these terms, throwing first for the god and then for himself, he found himself beaten." Unquote. Before continuing this amusing tale, I wish to point out that the self-referentiality lies in the sequentiality of the dice throws. For the first throw, Hercules' priest imagines himself to be the god. For the second throw, the priest is himself. Furthermore, the priest must also imagine himself to be a witness to the transaction, who ensures that the priest deal fairly with the god. In other words, the priest must think as he throws the dice, Now I am the priest, now I am the god. Therefore, there must be present in the priest's mind a third imaginary person who, observing the two dice throws, remains identical throughout the transaction in order to witness the alternation of identities. This third person, in fact, assumes the same abstract point of view that allows Lucullus to assert that Lucullus dines with Lucullus. But to continue the story... After the god wins the throw, quote, wishing to pay his stakes honorably and holding himself bound by what he had said, both provided the deity a good supper and giving money to Laurentia, then in her beauty, though not publicly known, gave her a feast in the temple, where he had also laid a bed, and after supper locked her in, as if the god were really to come to her. <laughs> 
And indeed, it is said the deity did truly visit her and commanded her in the morning to walk to the marketplace and whatever man she met first to salute him and make him her friend. She met one named Terutius, who was a man advanced in years, fairly rich, without children, and had always lived a single life. He received Laurentia and loved her well, and at his death left her sole heir of all his large and fair possessions, most of which she, in her last will and testament, bequeathed to the people. It was reported of her, being now celebrated and esteemed the mistress of a god, that she suddenly disappeared near the place where the first Laurentia lay buried. The spot is at this day called Velabrum, because the river frequently overflowing, they went over in ferry boats somewhere hereabouts to the Forum, the Latin word for ferrying being Velatura. Others derive the name from vellum, a sail, because the exhibitors of public shows used to hang the road that leads from the Forum to the Circus Maximus with sails, beginning at this spot. Upon these accounts, the second Laurentia is honored at Rome. Unquote. One can't help but be tantalized by the parallelism between the two Laurentias, the twins Romulus and Remus, and the double selves of the priest of Hercules, as if the legend were a coded mythological overgrowth of an original theory of mind which was obscured by subsequent philosophers with other agendas. A third example of self-referentiality is from the Roman historian Livy, book 21, and involves Hannibal performing an animal sacrifice in order to seal an oath. The self-referentiality lies in the choreography of the sacrifice. Quote, it was there, Victumula, that Hannibal had his camp, who, quickly recalling Mahabal and his cavalry, when he saw that a battle was imminent, called his troops together, for he never felt that he had done enough in the way of preparing and cheering the men, and held out definite rewards to them to fight for. He would give them land, he said, in Italy, Africa, or Spain, as each might choose, tax-free immunum to the recipient and to his children. Those who had rather have money than land, he would content with silver. If any of the allies desired to become citizens of Carthage, he would give them the opportunity. As for such who preferred to go back to their homes, he would see to it that they should feel no inclination to change places with any of their countrymen. Besides this, he promised freedom to the slaves who had come with their masters. Servis quoque dominos prosecutis, libertatem proponent, and declared that he would make restitution to the latter, that is, the masters, at the rate of two for one, and that they might know that these promises would be kept. He held a lamb with his left hand and with his right a flint, and praying that if he should deceive them, then Jupiter and the other gods might slay him, even as he had slain the lamb, he thereupon smote the lamb's head with the stone. Then indeed they all, as though each had received the blessing of the gods on their own particular hopes, and thought that their fulfillment was being delayed, only because they were not yet fighting, cried out with one accord and one voice for battle. Unquote. The translator B. O. Foster notes In this ceremony, the flint symbolizes the thunderbolt of Jupiter. Unquote. If so, then Hannibal's raised arm represents the arm of Jupiter, Hannibal's intention to slay the lamb, Jupiter's intention to slay a forsworn Hannibal, if such should occur, and the lamb, the future forsworn Hannibal himself. Therefore, when Hannibal slays the lamb, Jupiter Hannibal slays sacrificial lamb Hannibal, but logic insists that Hannibal, who acting in his own behalf, 
simultaneously plays both roles must assume a third point of view, that of the witness Hannibal observing the sacrifice. And so here again, a person cannot refer to himself without splitting in two, not as an end in itself, but in order to create a witness who, looking on at the opposed selves, reunites them in a single, presumably more comprehensive, if more disembodied vision. A fourth example of self-referentiality I draw from William Shakespeare's drama Richard III, Act 5, Scene 3, in which Richard wakes from a dream, but a few preliminary remarks are necessary in order to decipher Shakespeare's psychology of murder. Killers cannot pity the victims they are about to kill. Otherwise, the killers would refrain from killing them, the reason being that to pity someone is to identify with that person, to put oneself in the other's place, and in the case of being about to murder someone, to experience the victim's terror of impending death as one's own terror. Now, this terror of impending death is precisely what murderers don't want to experience when they're about to kill someone. For then the only way open to the murderer to relieve his his or her own terror of death is to spare the victim. This murderers are resolved not to do. Instead, they suppress pity for the victim. But by doing so, they inadvertently render themselves incapable of self-pity. The psychology here being, and it is a psychology associated with ancient Senecan tragedy with which Shakespeare is presumed to have been familiar, that by hardening oneself against the terror of death felt by the victim, murderers render themselves insensitive to their own terror of death. But since sympathy for someone undergoing such terror is the source of pity, murderers also render themselves incapable of self-pity. The assumption here is that the self-identity of the individual as an individual existing apart from the group is indissolubly joined to the self-identity of the individual as a member of the group. Owing to this indissoluble unity of individual and social selves, self-pity, in the good sense that one is worthy of pity, and self-love, in the non-egotistical sense that one is worthy of being loved, are one and the same. Since, however, in the course of the soliloquy, Richard bases his defense for his reprehensible actions on self-love, that is, that the individual's regard for himself supersedes and vanquishes every other interest, but discovers that he has lost his capacity for self-pity by the very act of having suppressed it, lest he pity his victims and thus refrain from killing them, he acknowledges that he is incapable of self-love, and so his defense is without merit. One final consideration before presenting the text. Richard assassinates his victims during a, quote, weak piping time of peace, unquote, not during the course of a war. In general, the mores of most societies allow their soldiers to kill the enemy without incurring the stigma of murderer, so long as the soldiers carefully distinguish between, on the one hand, the civilians they have been assigned to defend, or, as in the case of an occupation army, assigned to liberate, and with whom the soldiers presumably sympathize, and, on the other hand, the enemy. But when civilians and enemy soldiers are indistinguishable, as in an insurgency, then, in order to protect themselves, soldiers must suppress their sympathy for civilians. At such a juncture, the distinction between authorized killer and lawless murderer becomes blurred, with the result that some soldiers begin to question their authority to take lives, whereas other soldiers become killing machines. Richard belongs to the first group. Richard commits his acts as a soldier, but his victims are civilians.
since he commits acts which unequivocally prove him to be an enemy of civilians and not their defender, even in his own eyes he no longer enjoys the Im immunity granted to a soldier from the charge of murder. Now for the text. Richard has just awoken from a nightmare. Shakespeare intentionally withholds the content of the nightmare until the end of the soliloquy in order to forestall the audience's premature condemnation of Richard and to focus its attention instead on Richard's dialectical response. Immediately upon wakening, Richard feels terror as if someone were about to kill him but at the same time he knows that no one else is present. Thereupon begins a court trial involving three Richards. A prosecuting attorney represents Richard's social self, that is, the Richard who is a member of the crowd that is humanity. A defense attorney who represents the autonomous Richard, that is, the independent Richard who exists apart from the crowd and the judge, who hears the case and represents Richard's unbiased and objective consciousness, the witness of the other two Richards. The soliloquy begins, as I say, with Richard awakening with terror from a nightmare in which he is about to be murdered. Have mercy, Jesu! These words, which involuntarily escape Richard, express the terror of the defenseless victim, dependent for its survival upon the mercy of the killer. But recovering his poise, Richard's autonomous self replies encouragingly, Soft, I did but dream. O oh, coward conscience, how dost thou afflict me? Conscience here sounds the alarm when the obligations to self and society are in conflict. Conscience calls for compensation for injury to one or the other. The narrative voice continues. The lights burn blue. It is now dread midnight. Cold fearful drops stand on my trembling flesh. What? Do I fear myself? There is none else by. Here the narrative fissures into the duality which underlies it, the autonomous self and the social self. The autonomous self begins its defense. Richard loves Richard, that is, I am I. The self, by definition, is self-loving. It must be self-loving in order to keep its balance as it, makes it way, as it makes its way through a resistant world composed of others who also love themselves. Is there a murderer here? No. Yes, I am. Shakespeare plays on the equivocation of murderer, a person about to murder Richard and someone, namely Richard himself, who has murdered others. Then fly from the Richard about to murder Richard. What? From myself? That is, from Richard the murderer of others? Great reason why, lest I revenge. Lest, that is, Richard avenge himself on himself for murdering himself. What? Myself upon myself? Alack, I love myself. Wherefore, for any good that I myself have done unto myself? Oh no, alas, I rather hate myself for hateful deeds committed by myself. I am a villain. But at once the autonomous self interrupts and it exhorts Richard to brazen out his sense of guilt. Yet I lie. I am not a villain. Fool of thyself, speak well. Fool, the social self retorts. Do not flatter. The judge, Richard's detached witness, comments on the disposition so far of Richard's case, which is not looking good for the autonomous self. As the proceedings continue, however, autonomous and social selves will, be, will begin to merge into the single Richard, who shortly must pull himself together and assume command of his army. My conscience has a thousand several, that is, separate 
tongues, and every tongue brings on a several tale, and every tale condemns me for a villain. Perjury, perjury in the highest degree, objects the autonomous self. Murder, stern murder in the direst degree, answers the social self. Finally, the autonomous self, its self-love notwithstanding, is cowed by the condemnatory witnesses. All several sins, all used in each degree, throng to the bar, crying all, guilty, guilty, I shall despair, the broken autonomous self confesses. There is no creature loves me. It appears now that the self-love of the autonomous self requires confirmation by the social self that the former is worthy of its self-love, a confirmation which, of course, in Richard's case, is out of the question. In the next line, we see why there is need for confirmation of the autonomous self. And if I die, no soul will pity me. That is, it is the autonomous self alone that dies, leaving behind a social self in the form of one's reputation. Finally, in a single verse, Shakespeare exposes the dialectic of the triple selves. Nay, wherefore should they, since that I myself find in myself no pity to myself? As explained above, Richard has suppressed pity in order to murder others, his capacity for pity having atrophied through lack of exercise, there is none left for himself. Moreover, since the ability to pity oneself is the mark of self-love, Richard has proven to himself that he cannot love himself, and so his defense of his actions, which depended on the genuineness of his self-love, is groundless. Having concluded his defense, Richard reveals the content of his nightmare, the cause of his initial terror. Methought the souls of all that I had murdered came to my tent, and every one did threat tomorrow vengeance on the head of Richard. Richard has previously overlooked the power of his victims to avenge their deaths. He ends the soliloquy by acknowledging their power as expressed in his foreboding concerning the outcome of the forthcoming military engagement, and perhaps also in the outcome following his death of a life to come. Groucho Marx provides a final example of self-referentiality. Groucho wrote to a friend, I sent the Friars Club a wire stating, Please accept my resignation. I don't want to belong to any club that will accept people like me as a member. The wit lies in the double meaning of the phrase, people like me. In one sense, me refers to the person who does not qualify socially to be a member of an exclusive club. In a second competing sense, me refers to a person who does qualify to be a member of an exclusive club, but because he qualifies, he is by definition too conceited to be worth knowing. Since the opposed me's apply simultaneously to one and the same speaker, then clearly the speaker's self is divided. But at the same time, since the speaker is one and the same person, then in the very act of referring to his divided self, he embodies in his own person the unity which might heal the division. But how is this unity, which is to integrate the warring me's, to manifest itself? in the amusement of a transcendent me, observing its body, talking to itself. Etymology of self. If we trace the etymology of the word self, S-E-L-F, we find that it has two basic meanings. On the one hand, self refers to what is customary, and on the other hand, to what is set apart. The Latin possessive pronoun suus, S-U-U-S, means one's own, oneself, and thus translates as his, hers, or its. Suus, 
whose verbal root is S-U-E, is cognate with suesco, a Latin verb which means I am used to doing something. Suus and suesco, in turn, are cognate with Greek ethos, the syllable su of a theoretically reconstructed uh, Greek word suethos having disappeared, which means what is customary or traditional among one people or nation as distinct from all other nations. Hence, to act ethically is to behave in a customary manner that is generally approved. The negative feeling of the word insolent, literally to act contrary to custom, the verbal root S-O-L, as in the Latin verb soleo, which, like suesco, also means to be in the habit of, to be used to, conveys the preference among all peoples for customary behavior over the spontaneous, insolent acts of individuals. On the other hand, and here, where the customs of one nation differ from those of another, we move from the meaning of self as customary to its meaning as customized, that is, adapted to an individual, in this case to an individual nation as distinct from other nations. For since the customs of nations differ from one another, the ethos of one nation sets it apart from other nations. Hence, from the point of view of other nations, ethos implies the characteristic behavior of a group of people as if, an idea popular in the 19th century, they were a single collective person who, with respect to other nations, acts as it pleases, even to the point of insolence. The same convergence of the customary and customized appears in the Sanskrit word svada, S-V-A-D-H-A, a word, cog- a word cognate with the root S-U-E. Svada means self-set, as when we say that someone is set or fixed in his ways or behavior. Hence, svada means to act according to one's habit or pleasure, and hence to act spontaneously, willingly, easily, freely. To sum up, we can say that myself is the person I usually am, that is, the person who behaves in a manner which others recognize as mine. The above is the social definition of self, the ways of thinking and feeling that in general one shares with others. But there is another definition of self, which is the corollary of the social, the self as set apart from everyone else. Not just one nation set apart from every other nation, but one person set apart from every other person. The Greek word idios, I-D-I-O-S, according to Johann Baptist Hoffmann, Etymologisches Wörterbuch des Griechischen, whence English idiot, derives, according to Hoffmann, from the reconstructed word suid, as if idios had originally been surios or sidious, which basically means sundered, apart, as in sedition, literally in Latin, sed itio, a going apart. Sued is also cognate, like suesco, with the Latin pronomial adjective suus, his, hers, its, also with sed, s-e-d, which means but, a disjunctive connector in Latin, and finally with se, s-e, the Latin reflexive pronoun meaning self. Cognate as well is segregate, to separate from the herd, and also sequester, in English originally a legal term meaning to set apart property confiscated for purposes of bail. So the self is what is set apart from every other person. An animal intuits that its body is autonomous, that is, that it functions independently from the bodies of other animals, but it cannot know that its body belongs to itself unless it can imagine itself other than its body, as knower or observer of something is distinct from the object known or observed. 
and then negate that distinction, the negation being the necessary condition for imagining the observer's self and body as an indivisible unity. Of course, to distinguish oneself from one's body in order to negate the distinction requires that one assume a point of view outside oneself and one's body. That is, logic requires what grandiloquently has been called the creation of a transcendent self, which must step outside the self in order to envision the unity of self and body. But the grandiloquence merely diverts attention from and suppresses the presence here of an infinite regress of points of view enfolded within the so-called transcendent self. Since one can easily imagine assuming the point of view of a self that lies outside the transcendent self, and so is still more transcendent than the transcendent self, and another point of view outside that self, and so on ad infinitum. Although scientists and philosophers dismiss infinite regress as a logical nuisance, they secretly abhor it as they would a thought which enters the house of reason with a bomb strapped to it. The bomb in this case being the very idea of infinity which can be relied upon to turn our most cherished ideals into cotton candy. Finally, let me say in general that it is from this human facility to imagine oneself other than oneself that provides the psychological basis for the belief that a disembodied self exists, the belief of a person who, by failing to take the third unifying step of negating the distinction between body and self in order to reunite them, elects for a permanently disjointed self, sanctioned by God, and not to be reunited until some future timeless date. The Cult of Self The cult of self, of which we are all members, since we all believe that we have a self, may very well have arisen with the development of landed wealth, a fixed form of wealth, so that as communal land became privatized, the selfhood of the individual owner having the cult of self, of which we are all members, since we all believe that we have a self, may very well have arisen with the development of landed wealth, a fixed form of wealth, so that as communal land became privatized, the selfhood of the individual owner having become identified with the privatized land, became privatized as well. Consequently, as the land became separated from the commune, so the individual became separated from the mass. If so, the value of land and the enhanced consciousness of self parallel each other. Yes, the premise here is that human nature is, un is not unalterably fixed, but rather arises from adaptation to material conditions. Therefore, if material conditions change, human nature changes with it. It follows, then, that if we intentionally alter material conditions so, th so that they are less competitive by, say, redistributing equally the wealth created in an economy in which everyone is equally invested, we change human nature by changing the emphasis from being publicly competitive with cooperation reserved for private life to being publicly cooperative with competition assuming a natural place in private activities. The strategy, then, for evolving human nature requires altering material conditions in the direction we desire. Aguirre Emanuel, in his book Unequal Exchange, wrote in the late 1960s, The first thing that started the long process of dissolving the primitive community and preparing the grounds for the law of value that is, the money price of land, 
was a tribute levied on the produce of the soil by some ruler or bandit. It was the regularity with which this right was exercised and the fixing of its amount in proportion to a certain area of land that led to the idea of the first kind of private ownership, property in land. And it was the capitalization of this right of ownership, that is, the money value of the tribute paid, that produced the price of land, unquote. I recall in connection with the regularity with which this right was exercised, that the Latin word which means to be customary is suesco, which, as explained above, is etymologically related to the word self. Emmanuel explains how in the following centuries the triumph of private property served to rationalize the wrongful appropriation of communal land. Quote, by, declaring unoccupied, by declaring unoccupied all the land that was not under cultivation or was not occupied on an individual basis in accordance with the European legal fiction that refused to recognize collective tribal ownership, the colonial powers put immense tracts of land at the disposal of the colonizers without requiring any payment from them beyond a small tax that was negligible in comparison with the return to be had on the capital invested." Unquote. The importance of regular levies of tribute or tax as a harbinger of private property is likewise documented by Max Weber in The Agrarian Sociology of Ancient Civilizations. Quote, the division of ancient Israel into 12 tribes was used to apportion tax payments in kind for army and court each tribe being responsible for a month's expenses. The tribal system may have been inspired by ancient local bands, but it was itself established as an artificial division for the same purpose, that is, for the purpose of apportioning tax payments, as that of similar systems in the Greek warrior states." Unquote. Emmanuel, of course, goes beyond Weber in asserting that with the formation of private property, the regular levies also served as a stimulus to the development of a sense of private as distinct from communal consciousness. In other words, contributed to, cult, to a cult of self. Eureka, which in Greek means I found it, or description of the pornographic thought which led to what I believe is a novel and convincing way of conceiving human identity. My first thought, which ultimately led to a concept of human identity more in keeping, I felt, with actual experience, was frankly pornographic. Suppose while you're sucking my dick, I speculated, I feel a pang of hunger, and also I need to take a shit. Because my body is uniful, that is, because I only have one body, I feel three sensations at once. I am simultaneously aware of three quite different locations because I am present at each location. I am in three places at once. I loiter at my anus, I rummage through my stomach, and I feel welcome in your mouth. Let me try again, I thought to myself. I almost have it. I sit at my desk. I feel my ass in the chair, my feet on the floor, my hand on the desktop. I surmise that my awareness of the different locations of the same tactile sensation is a product of my feeling simultaneously the different locations of the sensation. For if I did not feel the different locations simultaneously, I would have an ass, a foot, a hand, but I wouldn't be aware that the possessor of them was the same person, namely me.
that the simultaneity personifies itself as me. Furthermore, to generalize from different locations simultaneously felt of the same tactile sensation to different sensations, sight and hearing, for instance, simultaneously felt, my consciousness of myself is essentially linked to the simultaneity of sensations abstracted from sensation. My body, then, is the place where different physical events, that is, different sensations, randomly occur at one and the same time. But because they occur in the same place, namely my body, at the same time, they appear significant, that is, they lead up to and signify me as the agent of consciousness. To put it differently, if I define synchronicity as the occurrence at the same time of coincidental events as if the conjunction of events had been intended and therefore was meaningful, if not even magical, then my consciousness of myself is an ongoing synchronicity radiating meaning which, however, is the product of merely coincidental the product of a merely coincidental confluence of random sensations. But let me go one step further, even at the risk of appearing incomprehensible. If simultaneity of diverse sensations produces an ongoing synchronicity called consciousness of myself, then the simultaneity of the diverse consciousnesses of different people who, let us suppose, were somehow persuaded to associate with each other in an amicable amicable manner may possibly produce a macro-synchronicity occurring within a social body called collective consciousness. As Hegel and Marx feared to admit, lest they be stigmatized as unscientific, society may very well be a person, at present no more than a scarecrow, that is, an effigy of itself, whose self-awareness manifests by fits and starts in the inexplicable coincidences and synchronicities that befall individuals. To put it naively, if we can arrange living conditions so that everyone feels comfortable enough not to expect the worst from each other, reading each other's minds may make communication as we know it obsolete.